Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our uh, artist, uh, Trong Nguyen. Uh, he is uh, very graciously traveled from Vietnam to uh, speak about his artwork here today. Uh, again, we are also very happy to be his first solo museum here in the States. Uh, it is something that we have strived to kind of um, push forward in kind of our exhibitions here at uh, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. Um, and again, if you haven't had any time to look at his actual exhibition, it's just in the far gallery, uh, just through this corridor. And without further ado, Trong. Hello, thank you all for coming today. Um, if you can't hear me for any reason, if I'm not speaking into the microphone, please let me know. Um, so about three years ago, I uh, moved to Vietnam. And before that, I was living in New York City for about 15 years. And prior to that, I grew up here in Orlando, actually. I um, was born in Saigon, uh, which is now Ho Chi Minh City uh, originally. And my family immigrated to the United States at the end of the, the Vietnam War. Um, and so now that I'm back in Vietnam living there, it's kind of a, a, a full circle. Um, so. Um, I'm going to concentrate in this talk on works that I've been kind of producing within the last three years in Saigon to give you a sense of uh, my recent ideas and my recent um, kind of thought processes. Um, and also to give you a little idea about, um, about Vietnam itself and kind of what's going on over there and what, you know, how it's developing. It's, it's, it's such a, you know, it's so far away, half a world away, and it's, uh, it's so removed. So I, um, hopefully this talk will give you a little inkling of what's, uh, what's going on over there. Can we turn down the lights a tiny bit? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Austin. So let's see. So the, the first slide, there's um, a view from my, my apartment in, in, in Saigon of the Saigon River. And let me see, where to begin? So about three years ago, I came back to Vietnam to do an exhibition, a solo exhibition at a local art gallery there called Gallery Quinn. And, um, during that time, I was just kind of starting to investigate my, my history as a, as a Vietnamese person, Vietnamese American. And so I was working on this project at the time with a, a friend of mine who's a, a filmmaker, art collector. And we decided to uh, make a little short film about my family's time when we, we left Vietnam, which is covering this kind of one week period right before the end of the Vietnam War, where it was very hectic and, and crazy and people were trying to leave. and all that kind of good stuff. So when we left, it was um, 11 people in my family. So I come from a very big family with my parents and, and nine kids. And when we left, we left um, together as a complete unit, uh, along with two cousins and an uncle. So 14 of us left together. And so when we came over here, we didn't really speak about it anymore after that. And so this particular short film that we decided to embark on kind of looks at um, this kind of one week period when we left and kind of where our memory intersects and how people remember these moments um, in, in history, you know, how we um, really remember differently from one person to the next, even though we all experienced the same, same event. So right before I left in New York, I was working on this project, which is called Dong, <laughs> which is um, the, a, a Vietnamese word meaning multiple things. And um, one of the projects that I, um, that I made, and there were several other supplementary projects related to it, um, was this silkscreen project that um, kind of appropriated uh, Robert Indiana's love um, posters and sculptures. And um, if you're familiar with that, um, in New York anyway, there's a giant sculpture of the, of the love piece, and Robert Indiana recently uh, passed away. Um, and with a lot of my projects, there's always a kind of conceptual underpinning that's, uh, that's a bit awkward, that's a bit unusual. And so for this, even this print project related to the film, I work with the, one of, uh, of Robert Indiana's master printers. So all the colors that you see in these prints, all the mixings are, are basically coming directly from his studio. So what I'm going to play to you is a little um, trailer that we made for this, this short film. Um, and it again, it recounts kind of uh, my family members and kind of interviews with them 
um, about this time when we left Vietnam, this harrowing time when you know all 14 of us um, on the day that Saigon fell squeezed into this tiny little Renault Dauphine and you know drove to the to the to the harbor to the to the Saigon River and got on basically the last boat leaving Saigon that day. And um, during the filming of this project, I realized that um, my my family um, were really bad interviewees. So, yeah, so they, you know, it, it's been a long time, so you lose information and you, you, you recollect very differently. And so it was also, you know, very difficult pulling information out of them. So some people are much more forward and open with their information and others tend to close up and, you know, through trauma or otherwise tend to really close up. And so um, in the process of making this, this documentary, we decided to, because my, my family were such terrible um, interviewees, um, we um, recorded a lot of the audio without, um, without the video. Um, and so we were getting information, but kind of trying to collect it in a way that, that made sense visually, cinematically. And so um, some parts in this movie, we decided that we were going to use surrogates for, for family members. So um, kind of conceptually, the, the project um, kind of confuses a lot of this stuff. So in a way, it's related to, to memory quite a bit because uh, it's, uh, again, it's no, one set, uh, it's no one set data, it's no one set information. So as, as you'll see here, um, it, it'll give you a good idea of what I'm speaking of. Cái chăm em cài làm do tình nhân em biếu đó chốn xa muôn trùng người yêu của em gửi về. I don't remember nothing. Schlong. So Dad wanted to take more people than we could. The car was large, like a like a station wagon, like an SUV. We saw a lot of tanks in front of our house that were just parked there because the war was over. On the road to the harbor, there were a lot of injured and, and dead people from the bombing of all ages, men, women, children, young and old. People were unable to help them. At the harbor, there were a lot of American ships before, but only one remained when we got there, and it was the Vietnamese ship number 402. It was renowned because it was the last ship to leave that day. Trump. It can be a derogatory term about race. It can reference the male member. It's the Vietnamese currency. And it's romanticizing the family. I think this film is about coloring in my family's past to the time before we came to the United States when all 11 of us left at the end of the Vietnam War. But exploring it from a creative dimension that takes license with the imperfections and inaccuracies of memory and our tendencies to embellish the past. Long? Automobile? <laughs> That's 14 people in one small car, a Renault Dauphine, with luggage. That's three at the front, and three at the back, and three on top of them, and five somewhere else. Um, my father seemed to know somehow where there was an American boat still harbored on the Saigon River. So we drove there. I remember there was lots of traffic. He said that uh, the brakes in the car weren't working. So whenever we wanted to stop, we had to put our feet out. By the time we got to the river, we had no shoes left. So. <laughs> I don't remember shit. <laughs> so like a, a lot of my works, there is kind of a, a playful dimension to it as well. Um, and like I said, with this uh, particular film project, it's, um, there's a lot of kind of conceptual underpinning. So even with the, the music that you hear in there, it's a, it's a, 
kind of Vietnamese rock and roll track from the from the 60s. And um, what I did with that particular music piece is I asked some friends of mine who are in a, a rock band from Detroit, people who don't speak uh, Vietnamese, to actually re-record the song. So it's people who don't speak Vietnamese or sing in Vietnamese doing their best impression of, uh, of this song. Um, one of the projects that kind of came from, from that documentary project um, relates to a series of paintings that I, I worked on that were shown in Vietnam um, the, when I was there three and a half years ago for this exhibition, right, right prior to, to moving there. And um, as you saw in the video, the, 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 the process is very similar to, um, to that kind of very kind of childlike sketching. And what I did was I took um, old family photographs, um, such as this one. And I made um, a line drawing of it. And process-wise, I, I projected this line drawing kind of onto raw canvas and then kind of colored it in as fast as I could. So you end up getting something like this, something that's kind of playful, childlike, and abstracted to some degree. And um, the important thing is, instead of using paint, I decided to use oil pastels so that, in a way, it was more like crown-like. It was, uh, you know, and I, I, I used different size implements. So some uh, oil pastels were very large and some smaller. So some, some of the effects are, are more um, abstract or representational than, than the other. And the important thing is because um, after I colored it in, which is a spontaneous act, I had, I, I turned off the projector and you're, 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 the, all the lines are removed, so you're left with this image of basically a, a coloring book that's been colored in for you, and in a way I'm asking of the viewer to kind of re-demarcate and, and redraw the lines to, in a way, uh, to, to fill in, you know, the, the limits of memory and the, 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 the details of memory. And um, as I said, the oil pastel was important because it's a medium that never fully dries. And so like, uh, like memory, it's organic, it's ever changing, it's ever shifting. And here are some more pieces. So a lot of these are taken from old archival family photographs from you know, refugee camps, um, uh, Mui Ne, which is a, a beach in, uh, in Vietnam, the closest one to Saigon. Um, my parents early on at the zoo, um, my grandmother's funeral, my parents on their wedding day, and then taking you know photographs from uh, America too when we came over here, kind of just um, um, again taking whatever kind of archival footage I have and kind of um, creating these uh, kind of more looser memories. And for this exhibition, I made a portrait of all the people that that you know, fit themselves in that one car and left. And so they're um, in the middle, of course, are my parents and my, my eight siblings and uh, my uncle and two cousins. And you can see that it has a very kind of loose Im impressionistic look. And then extended from that project, I started um, through the process of interviewing my family throughout the United States. And they're, of course, all here now kind of scattered. Some are in Florida, some are in Texas, some are in um, uh, Georgia and, and so on and so forth. And throughout this process of interviewing them, I, I, I ended up at all the houses we kind of lived in when we came to the United States, and I started photographing them, so as they are now, so about, which is now about four years ago. And what I decided to do is I, I found images, um, again, from our archives of, of these houses. So usually it's of you know, the children or the family kind of standing in front, posing as a group in front of these houses. And I rendered those particular images, like the paintings that I just showed you. But then what I did was I inlaid um, these particular paintings within um, a mounted photograph, which is a, a picture of the, the house as it is now. So the, um, the painting is from a photograph of a particular perspective of the house. And so it's, the, it's, the, it's all the same perspective. And so what I'm doing is I'm kind of inlaying and superimposing the, the past with the present of these houses. Here's another one. This one's of a, a house that we, we used to live in in Saigon. And um, of course, I was able to, to re-photograph it several years ago. This is from um, Oklahoma. So we, um, we initially um, came over to Oklahoma because we had a, an uncle there who was um, in the priesthood at the time in the Catholic Church. And at that time after the war, the Catholic Church was sponsoring a lot of Vietnamese refugees. And so we ended up there for several years before, before moving to Florida. This is in Orlando. This is a, another house in Saigon, in Oklahoma, Tallahassee. 
And that's that project. And so when I first landed in Saigon, um, which is a city of about 10 million people, so very busy, very hectic, very similar um, to, to New York City. So in a way, it was very home t homey to me because uh, of, of the energy, of the pace, um, of the kind of just all the excitement around you, you know, of all these things happening with all the, all the motorcycles, all the traffic, all the food, um, and, and yeah, and just kind of being bombarded and stimulated by so many things. And so it took a, a while for me to kind of um, wrap my mind around it all. And so one of the first things I did as an artist when I, when I moved there was to kind of go back thinking about um, these old retablos images for whatever reason, um, these images that you find in, in Mexico that are little devotional images that families used to commission artisans and artists to, to make on their behalf. Um, and you can still find these in like, you know, secondhand shops and, and, and flea markets and stuff in, in, in Mexico. And what they are are devotional images that kind of give thanks to a patron saint or the Virgin Mary um, for basically a, a miracle that happened in their lives. Um, whether that be uh, surviving a death, surviving a, a, a medical trauma, um, it can be almost anything. And there's a, a footprint for them, which is that they are um, they they always kind of depict what's going on. They're illustrating what's going on, and there's always a text that goes along with it. And they're they're also painted on old um, kind of like tin roof panels because uh, um, you know it was something that usually. Um, poor families commission so the so yeah so it was usually using very kind of cheap easy to find materials and they they have a, a charm to them and so these are some examples and so taking this idea what I decided to do was in Vietnam um, there's always you know a lot of stuff going on and so uh, every day you kind of see something kind of amazing whether that be you know people on motorbikes carrying you know six other people or all sorts of things and so I decided to make some retablos related to, to my experience of, uh, of, uh, of acclimating to, to Saigon. So one of the things that's um, very difficult to do in Saigon if you're a visitor for the first time is to cross the road. Um, there's usually like lanes and lanes of traffic, whether that be you know 10 lanes of motorcycle traffic, cars, everything's kind of zipping by. And it, it can be quite harrowing to to walk across because in half the city there's no crosswalks. So you have to really understand kind of the flow and the mentality of the people in order to, to cross the street properly without getting, getting flattened, you know. And people liken the, the traffic flow in, in Saigon sort of like to a river. It's kind of constantly flowing. And so as you're crossing the street, you, you try to do the same thing. You try not to stop like, like water. You try to just keep on moving and, and kind of trust the, the flow of the river. And so the first one I made, the first retablo I made um, in Saigon is related to that. And so the description is, thank you for crossing Vo Thi Sao in one piece, 12 May 2015. And Vo Thi Sao is just a road there. And one of the things I decided to do with this particular project was to kind of update it. So, you know, to contemporize it. So in the description, I decided to add uh, the modern hashtag, um, as you'll see in the, some of these descriptions. This is the second one I made. Um, it's of um, a local gym that I was going to where, uh, you know, it, it, it was so unlike anything that you would see in the West. You know, people go in there, they take off their flip-flops, they're working out barefooted, you know, they bring their kids in and, you know, their kids are treating all these weights and barbells as if it were, you know, plastic toys in, in a nursery or something. So very dangerous and, 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 you know, very, very whimsical at the same time. So this one says, Thank you for sparing this toddler from an ugly bench press death at my ghetto gym slash nursery while his dad stretches. Hashtag not equinox. Hashtag no shoes, no problem. Hashtag third world solutions. Hashtag can I have a spot bro. This next one is also from the same um, recreational center on this uh, outside of this gym. There's this beautiful running track with, uh, with stands and everything where um, where you know they have events and they have performances and and, and outdoor activities, and uh, it's completely a regular track except that when you're running around it, all of a sudden you are impeded by this house that just cuts across all the tracks. And 
you know, I don't know what happened, but these people just never left. And so when you are running, you know, jogging in the morning, you, you, every time you get to this corner, everyone just goes around, <laughs> around the house. Um, so it's kind of a, an amazing little, you know, a, amazing little sight. And so the text on this one says, um, thank you for this house obstructing the tracks running lanes. Hashtag eminent domain fail. This next one says, I'll just go through these quickly. Thank you for Seom delivery services and this mattress man. Hashtag I can drive 55. Hashtag door to door. Hashtag it's still firm. Hashtag no sleep till Taodian, which is a, a, my neighborhood in, in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, this one says, is of me falling down, falling down the stairs. In the middle of my shower, the electricity collection man rang the doorbell. In a hurry, I ran out of the shower half wet down the ultra slick stairs. Thank you for slipping and falling on my ass only seven steps instead of the full three flights to an untimely tragedy. Hashtag slip sliding away. Hashtag ever heard of online bill pay. Hashtag skinny ass meets hard floor. Hashtag stairway to hell. Um, as you can see, I mean, the, the traditional uh, Mexican retablos, they, there is, um, there's this religious aspect to it because Mexico is a, a very Catholic country. And so these are, are, are very secular in a way. It's, 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 it's not thinking anything. And a lot of the, the, the so-called miracles that go on here are, are what I call kind of micro minor miracles, you know, of, of every day. So this one says, thank you to this fantastic woman who swiftly fixed my scooter's flat rear tire. Hashtag clueless dude, hashtag on the road again, hashtag no mansplaining, hashtag the present is female. And outside my door one day, there was this uh, gentleman plumber who was uh, kind of just submerged in, this, uh, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the concrete. And so it was a, a very, very weird image, um, but very beautiful at the same time. Thank you to this plumber for doing whatever he's doing down there. Hashtag not a pool party. Hashtag where do we come from? Hashtag what are we? Hashtag where are we going? Last one. Saigon, 28 May 2015. Thank you for hiring this man as a travel agent and not as an air traffic controller. Hashtag do not disturb. Hashtag siestas without borders. Hashtag productivity is overrated. This is um, an image of Saigon now. Um, it's, uh, it's a city that's going, undergoing a lot of um, kind of positive economic development. Um, they're building an uh, above ground uh, metro system. They are building lots and lots of buildings. Um, about 10 years ago, there was uh, one skyscraper in, or one tall building, not quite a skyscraper in Saigon. And now um, there must be hundreds and hundreds of buildings that have you know 30 stories or more. This is a, a view in um, District 2, which is right outside the center of, um, from my, my friend's studio. And you can see all the buildings and cranes in the background. Um, you know, and through this process of, of urbanization in Vietnam, what you are losing is this kind of um, traditional way of life that, um, that is more what I would call kind of a more horizontal way of life. So you have a lot of, um, this is more typical of a, a traditional street in Saigon where you have um, kind of shops, uh, ha shop houses with shops on the bottom floor. You have vendors, you have people selling food, and it's, it's a very horizontal way of life where people um, are very socially active, they're socially engaged every day, and, and through the process of, of building all these towers and kind of displacing these people, um, a lot of times the government will will just uproot entire neighborhoods and flatten out neighborhoods and force people into these um, you know, vertical high rises, and through that process, they, they they lose a lot of their quality of life because no longer are you able to to step out and talk to your neighbors. You know, you're 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 now in a building with uh, with elevators, stairs, and so you 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 quickly lose this way of life. And so this is a just of a of a plot of um, of uh, of land in in District Two, and you can see the buildings in the background. So. You know, there, there, there's a, a, a beauty to it, but at the same time, it's very um, tragic and sad, this kind of disappearance of, a, of, a, of this way of life. And so evolving from um, these retablos, I started thinking about kind of this architecture in Vietnam and its kind of disappearance and its, its, its evolution. And um, coming from America, one of the other things that I was thinking about was this notion of, of the American dream. You know, when you think about, um, you know, having a three-bedroom house, two-car garage, you know, one television, um, white picket fence, all these things. 
I started making objects that, that related to this idea of, um, of the American dream and kind of trying to superimpose, taking this idea of superimposing the American dream upon the, the Saigon landscape. And so one of the objects I made was um, this, this, um, this, this fence that's of course related to the iconic American white picket fence, this symbol of the American dream. And again, kind of updating it in, in, in Vietnamese style and form as, a, as a, a yellow hashtag fence. And so I started making these kind of modular fence, uh, these modular fences. So um, all these little units were painted in, in varying shades of yellow. So kind of related to, of course, skin and, and, and ethnicity and all these things and, and this ability to, to come together, to, to be individuals at the same time. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is maybe divert a little bit to various past projects to kind of fill you in a little bit more with, with what I'm doing and what I've done um, to maybe give you a fuller sense of, uh, of, of how I work and think. So this particular project is, is meant to be indoor, outdoor, and um, it, it, it relates to a few things. Um, I wanted to divert to this project from the, the past where I was um, kind of creating um, these architectural footprints on, on natural grass. Um, they're, they're architectural blueprints that are imaginary or that come from, from real sources. And usually they're of spaces that contain trauma, that contain difficult events. Um, and I've imprinted them on, on grass, which is something, of course, very natural. You walk on it, you sit on it, you picnic on it, and uh, it grows back ultimately. So. This version is from um, Socrates Sculpture Park for uh, a biennial that they do um, every every two years, of course, called um, uh, Float, um, because it's it's right by the um, it's by, right by the East River, and um, this particular house print that you see here is taken from a, a, a novel by Slavenka Draculic, um, who is a, a a Bosnian woman who kind of survived the the Bosnian War as a yeah, well. Actually, oh, sorry, uh, my mistake. She's a, a, a documentarian who kind of looked at the, the Bosnian War and documented specifically women who were kind of kept prisoners during the war um, and their experiences, um, um, yeah, uh, their experiences as, a, as people who kind of have lost their land, who have, um, through this process, have kids who have uh, grown up and born through, um, uh, through, through an area where there's no, there's, there's, there's no nationality, there's no... Um, there's no certitude. Um, so this one is called. Um, let me see. This one is called Women's Room, and in uh, her novel Slavenka Draculic's S, um, it recounts this again. This woman who was kept as, as a prisoner by the the Serbian forces in this building, and in this recount, this woman talks about women who were kind of kept in this uh, this one room with seven beds, which is what the imprint you see there with a, a, a bathroom, a, a small window, and a door. And harrowingly, she recounts like every night, you would hear kind of a knock on the door, and there would always be you know, a Serbian um, soldier who came to the door. And basically, he would pick somebody out in the room to, to go with him and to be, to be raped, essentially. And so um, visually, you know, when you're looking at something like this, it's, uh, again, kind of very playful, very very easy, very um, comforting, um, but the knowledge of what it represents creates this kind of complicity. Um, and, and in a number of my works, I try to create this kind of subtle interactive element that isn't always obvious, but then is also hopefully enlightening in, 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 in some form or, or another. Okay, so going back to, to Saigon and kind of the, the development, um, this is a, another version of the, the modular hashtag picket fences. And you can see again that there's a building going on in the background. And this is in District 2. This is another version of the yellow picket fence where I made a, a, an exact replica of it in, uh, in black metal, uh, which forms the feet of it too. And it's kind of a playful take uh, on kind of race relations in a way because normally you would not see um, a shadow that is a, that's an exact replica. The shadow is always distorted, it's always at an angle, it's always at a certain perspective. But if you um, flap this up, it's the exact shape. So in a way, it's looking at this kind of balance. This is a, an installation in Hanoi at the French Embassy at a space called L'Espace. Um, that is their, their cultural center. And I did a show there last year, um, early last year, so almost um, a, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, 
that I decided to use the theme of, a, of the term, um, kind of a derogatory term called bananas. And it, it refers uh, to individuals like me, um, Asians who kind of grew up overseas and who supposedly have kind of lost contact with the motherland. And so bananas kind of, um, again, derogatorily represents someone who's kind of yellow on the inside and white on, uh, I'm sorry, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. And so I decided to do an entire exhibition kind of loosely based on this theme and um, and, and by extension, this notion of, you know, uh, the kind of colonization, decolonization, and, and Vietnam itself, how it still has a lot of uh, French influences to this day. And so you can see the evolution of some of these works. There was a, a, a tunnel painted on the wall with a, a light that was embedded that, that shined out, leading maybe to nowhere. Um, there was another piece in the show that um, that I made that uh, is this kind of a planchette that you would see in a, a Ouija board game. Um, it's something with the, in the game, if you know it, it has a, a, a magnifying glass and you kind of let your hand move and it goes over letters to spell out the answers to the questions you're asking. And so for this exhibition, I decided to basically explode a, a Ouija board. So where all the texts and, and letters in, in, in French, English, and Vietnamese were scattered all over the floor. And this um, this planchette is a, actually a robotic device that uh, is sort of like you know one of those robotic room cleaners, and it kind of just roamed the space and it kind of stopped and went kind of wherever it it it, it wanted to. You can see there it's a, a little clearer. Um, I made a s set of ping pong tables for the exhibition that were all painted in different shades of yellow, sort of like the picket fences. Again, kind of relating to this notion of a of, of a banana Asian. And uh, this particular ping pong table is what I call like a, an existential ping pong table in a way you're playing against yourself, you know, where there's no win, there's no losing, um, and it's an, an exercise in, in reflection. It's another version of it. Um, I was also making these works on mirror that were containing text that, um, that, that again, kind of question this notion of um, colonization and exploitation and and where Vietnamese find themselves today in present Vietnam, um, uh, you know, one can look at kind of this uh, this exploitation, this decolon uh, this colonization as creating this kind of society that may be lost, that may be trapped in a certain state. Um, what what I see in Vietnam is kind of this uh, this contemporary society that's moving very fast. That um, that in a way is more, uh, by you know by plain sight is very capitalist. So it, it looks no different from any kind of capitalist society. And so, um, what is supposed to be a communist society, in 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 my opinion, ends up looking a lot, of course, like capitalism. And the people who are in charge and who are at the top are, in a way, um, sort of like you know uh, Orwell's Animal Farm. They've kind of uh, they've kind of assumed these kind of authoritarian positions, and in the end, start looking a lot like their uh, their previous oppressors. And so, I wanted to question that um, in in a subtle way, without getting censored and and things of that sort in Vietnam. So this one um, is a mirror again, and it's cracked. Um, it's cracked. It looks cracked, but it's a. Uh, it's made from um, cut uh, plex uh, mirror plexiglass in in yellow and, and clear, and it says, uh, of course, "Ceci n'est pas un selfie," which is uh, related to uh, Magritte's "This is not a pipe." This is another one. It says "Toi la con người," which in Vietnamese means um, "I I am a human." So it's kind of in a way replicating. Um, the, the famous protest signs that one saw in, in, in the in the sixties of African Americans that said I, I I am a man. This one say who's the whitest of them all, which is related to the the issue I think of the um, of, of the current day politicians assuming the role of the oppressor that I, I spoke about earlier. This one says foreigner in French. Fool's code. And this one just says uh, made in Vietnam in multiple languages. Um, keeping on this thread of, uh, of kind of text-based works, which I've dabbled in and out of over, over the years, I wanted to divert a little bit to um, objects that, um, for me, one of the, th the themes that I've been playing with over the years is this notion of, a, of, of the man cave, you know, this idea in a suburban home where the husband or the partner 
um, the, the, the male partner has this room in the house where you know nobody's allowed to go and it's, he, it's where he and his friends can get together and watch a football game, play billiards, play darts and, and they're you know with the with with a black leather sofa and couch for furniture and a wet bar, all these things. I kind of wanted to explore this notion of the of, of the of the man cave a bit. And so a number of these objects that I'll I'll show you next are kind of related to that idea and that notion of um of manhood and uh, of uh, yeah of of kind of um, you know in a way um, you know male domination sexism all these things. So at some point um, and this is a diversion this is an older work but I started making these cakes out of oil paint. So in a way they're neither neither painting or sculpture. I just kind of laid on very thick um, cre recreating a cake and kind of in a way. Um, using text that celebrated um, what one would say are, are the wrong things or, or inappropriate things. So this one says happy birthday war and in a way the, the design of it has kind of um, uh, combined the, the, the traditional uh, Vietnamese flag before the, before the end of the war and the, the current flag which incorporates a star. This one says red rum and we all know where that comes from. And so this particular body of work with, uh, with, with suggestive texts have kind of also evolved over the years. And so I've been kind of making these for, for a while. And um, the ones that I made in recent, uh, in recent years are, are a bit more absurdist. They, they, you know, they have these kind of playful, again, this playful meaning to them. So this one is a, a ceiling cake. So again, this kind of absurdist cake that's kind of hanging on the ceiling and it looks like it's, a, it's about to fall on you. It says, eat shit. <laughs> Is this another one? And again, this is uh, mostly made from, from paint. And I, I spent a, a lot of time one summer learning how to use a kind of cake decorating tools to, to make all these designs. That's another one. Okay, and then keeping on the vein of, um, of text works, um, one of a, a body of works that I've been kind of making for a long time are these works that are basically um, texts that are coming from my, my own personal library, from books and from, um, from, from readings and from, uh, yeah, from other libraries that, um, that, utilize, um, that utilize rice grains, essentially. So um, this particular project comes from a time when a, a friend of mine came to my house and she, she bought me this little, you know, in New York, in Soho, wherever it was, you can buy these little vows of, uh, that are filled with water and a rice grain and somebody will write, you know, your name on it or a little text on it for you. And um, I remember when I received this that I, I, I looked at it and I'm like, oh, it's cool, but you know, I can do much better than that. So this particular project, what I do is I, I first replicated these old kind of New York, these old library cards that you would find in books, in, 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 uh, in the back of books in the pocket when you check it out and return it. And um, utilizing this aesthetic, I, I imprint this, uh, this little index card, so these are quite small, onto a, a Mylar um, packet. And in these packets um, are basically the text to the books that you're seeing written, the books that are, um, that are, are cited at the top there. And so this is the, the, the Wizard of Oz. And um, it's usually the complete text uh, or a chapter depending on, on, uh, on um, dep depending on the length of it. These particular packets hold about 3,500 words. So basically what I'm doing is I'm writing word for word on grains of rice, these, these complete texts. This is a close up of the, the Wizard of Oz. And so it's a, a very kind of laborious process, which uh, is, is again another kind of motif that you will, you will find throughout my work, this idea of, uh, of labor and, and, and working to get towards things. This is a Guy Debord Society of the Spectacle, which contains about, these packets can hold about 35, 100 words, so if you can estimate, that's probably about 1,500 words. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night, um, first chapter, I think. This is the, f the full text of the Grimm Brothers' Cinderella. Kipling's The Jungle Book. Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. The Tale of Peter Rabbit. And this is all um, 10 letters from uh, Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet. In a detail. Um, so going back to the, the, the notion of the man cave and these objects that one would find in this kind of bachelor pad, 
um, you know, you, you normally would find like maybe a dartboard. So I started making these kind of playful dartboards that, um, that reference um, depictions of St. Sebastian in, uh, in Renaissance paintings. And if you are familiar, St. Sebastian is a saint who, who, is, um, uh, who, who is shot with arrows. He's always depicted, you know, tied and bound to a tree or a post with arrows piercing him. So it's a, a kind of playful take on that where these are in a way real, uh, real dartboards that one can, can utilize. You can see there the, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a Botticelli reference. So you can see the Botticelli on the left, and in the middle is a Antonio del Messina, de Messina, and on the right is Guido Reni. So this is the, the Guido Reni board. And so these objects um, usually are installed with a, a number of other objects as well. And here's the Messina one. So they're all, they're all hand painted and hand wired and such. Um, this is a, a, a velvet painting I made of an Air Jordan um, uh, basketball jersey, but kind of playfully using, it, uh, implicating it, uh, implicating sports in a way with kind of modern um, political issues. And so this one, of course, is Air Qaeda, and it's painted in a, it's a velvet painting, actually, so it's painted on black velvet. And by extension, going back <laughs> to Vietnam, um, I was making these... Um, in Vietnam, um, during the rainy season, you know, if uh, people are on their motorbikes a lot, I think there's about, um, I don't know, like five million motorbikes in, in Vietnam, and the, the traffic is very congested, so to get anywhere, you really need to be on, 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 on two wheels. And uh, during the rainy season, when it rains, people will immediately kind of stop by the side of the road and put on these rain ponchos. Um, and so I decided to make one that was, in a way, um, not really utilitarian. Um, one of the other things I do is that I, I kind of make things that are in a way like like art objects, kind of useless. They don't serve any any purpose, any utility. So this is a rain poncho that's made uh, from from just raw canvas. I wanted to make you to utilize materials that um, that um, that were the bare bones of of, of an artwork. So um, if you think about what a, a painting is, it's 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 wooden stretchers um, stretched over with uh, with canvas that's been been gessoed and so I in a way to me this is a, a a raw you know unpainted canvas except that I'm utilizing this shape of a of a poncho and um, the stand that is on is a, a clothes rack that has been shortened and, and lengthened at the top and in a way in this shape in this configuration it can allude to a number of things whether that be if you're coming from America that could be you know the Ku Klux Klan it can be um, you know, prisoners at Abu Ghraib, so it can be can be a number of things, um, and again, it it it, it uh, importantly serves kind of no purpose. And so, sticking to this man cave idea, this idea of um, of, of this kind of private space where um, you you have to yourself, where no one can kind of go in, it's a safe space. Um, this issue of uh, yeah of, of of privacy and and and, and kind of public. Uh, Public um, absorption, what you, whatever you want to call it. Um, I go to this next work, um, which is uh, two paper bags that I've um, hand cut little crosses in, and it's meant to mimic the confessional stands that one confessional booths that one sees in uh, in church. And this particular piece is called Portable Confessionals, and so it's hung on the wall, and people are invited to kind of just go under and and uh, you know and confess and to divulge uh, private information or whatever you want to do. It's again kind of meant to be to be playful and dealing with again issues of uh, kind of um, privacy that in uh, in the social media age is a, is, is a, is a, is a blurred line now of, uh, of, uh, of how, how, how much information is, a, is, is made public on a daily basis. That's a close-up. This is an older work, um, and I was making these objects that were kind of these kind of, I don't know what you call them, kind of like medieval torture devices and kind of looking at um, complicity in, in, many, um, in, in many wings of the, of the art world. And in this case, this one was made in um, 2008 um, in, in, in New York, and it's uh, related in a way to the, um, the, the economic crash and all these things and, and the role that, for instance, that collectors would play in it. So I made these medieval stocks that, um, as you can see, it spells out Collection Whitney, which is, of course, Whitney Collection in New York. Um, and I kind of consider these as a kind of like um, glorified vanity torture devices, if you, if you want to call them that. 
And so it's a, it's a fully working wooden stock. And so kind of taking this idea of a, of, of, of a stocks device and a play on, on words, so stocks meaning um, th this device itself or you know, stocks and bonds, stocks and bondage, all, the, all these kind of associations. And here's how it works. Another piece that, um, again, deals with kind of installational work that deals with kind of political interests is this uh, piece I did on um, Governor's Island in New York. And uh, if you're familiar with it at all, it's this tiny little island that's off the su um, southern coast of southern edge of Manhattan. And it's a, a former military island um, that, um, that was originally occupied by the by the Dutch in the seven, early 17th century. And uh, it was a former military base that hasn't been utilized since, I think, the, the 1980s. And so it's this beautiful island that, um, that they, they are transforming now into sort of like a, a public space. So there's a nice you know, bicycle path around the island. There's a fort on the island. And there's these beautiful old colonial homes on the, on the island that really remind you of New England, kind of in the middle of nowhere in New York. And so for a project there that was organized by a, uh, a group called No Longer Empty, this curatorial group. Um, they utilize this, the, the spaces on Governor's Island, including these old military homes. And um, the project that I decided to do for, for that exhibition was uh, the piece you see here, which is called um, Neo Theo, Possessed American Flag, um, which again was, um, was uh, occupied by the Dutch in 1624. And it consists of basically a bunch of uh, frame photographs of hands kind of um, in a salutation towards the flag, and the flag is a is a is a, a graffitied um, version of the flag. So it's it's hand painted, and you see this little um, paint painting light um, underneath it that's kind of upside down. Um, and what it's lighting is a a crease on the flag that spells the words "Help me," um, which uh, is taken from uh, the movie The Exorcist, if if you will remember. Um, and so when the Dutch um, settled this island, um, one of the laws that they instituted was this notion of religious freedom and, and, and religious freedom through the, the separation of church and state, which is, of course, in, in our constitution and which is uh, often ignored. And so this is the reference. <laughs> if you've seen The Exorcist, it, it might bring back bad memories. And so in, in the movie, at some point, the, 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 the girl is possessed by, by evil and in her stomach, on her stomach, these, uh, the, the words help me are imprinted. Um, they, they rise to the surface, and so like that, these flags is kind of um, kind of playing with this notion of desecration of the flag. I mean, and when you think of desecration of the flag, you think of people burning flags. You think of them really, you know, tearing, ripping it apart. And this is, in a way, a subtle act related to that, but at the same time, it isn't because the words are very carefully um, creased by hand, and at the end of the day, you know, it's very easily ironed out. So. One may call it desecration, or one may call it, you know, it's, it's temporal, whatever it is. And, um, okay, this is a, another close up, and you can see the image there. Um, and this piece, one of the things that in, it incorporates is it's in a full room with, um, again, all these hands that are pointed and sa saluting the flag in this kind of neo fascist um, fashion, in this neo fascist salute. And one of the one of the things that um, in America that we're not so aware of is the, the history of the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and it, it has not a dark history, but there's, there's a history to it that, that's pretty interesting. And the aesthetic that I use comes from that history. It was um, written by a, a man named Frank Bellamy in, um, in 1892. And um, officially, um, it was the, the salutation for the Pledge of Allegiance was actually to, to extend your arm. Um, as you can see in this picture of a, of, a, of a school with kids kind of doing the Pledge of Allegiance at the flag. Um, it was officially replaced by the hand over the heart salute when uh, Congress amended the flag code in um, 1942 during the, of course, during World War II when you had symbols of Nazism and, 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 and fascism kind of everywhere that was, that was uh, appropriating this, uh, this, this uh, action, this salutation. So when you go into this installation, the uh, you, you see this flag, you see these hands, and you, you also hear a, a loop of, a, of an audio, which I'll play for you. Um, oops, sorry. sorry. Um, and the loop of the audio um, 
is of the of the Pledge of Allegiance, of course, uh, with the words "Under God We Move." And even those words in the Pledge of Allegiance were only added in in, in 1954. So what we know of the Pledge of Allegiance today has really evolved over time. And I think with uh, with recognition of this kind of history, I think it can really enlighten what we and what we think and how we think about um, you know modern day nationalism and all these uh, issues that are popping up. I'll play you. <laughs> And it's just a, a loop in the room, so you're you're encountering this um, kind of uh, um, encompassing installation that is meant to be kind of very very dark and disturbing in ways. And see, these are close up of hands, and they're all kind of pointed the the correct direction of the flag. This is a, another view of the installation where uh, the hands are just placed at where where real hands would be. So going from uh, Governor's Island to another island in Vietnam, um, this is a, a beautiful little island on the east coast of, um, of uh, uh, the southeast coast of Vietnam called uh, Con Dao Island. And it's uh, one of the most kind of beautiful places in Vietnam that's, um, that's um, untouristed. So you, you, there's very little people there. So you can walk around, you can drive around on completely empty roads on the beach. And uh, it's a, an island that recently opened up to the public because um, in its history, it was a, in its dark history, it was a former prisoner's island, sort of like Alcatraz, where um, during um, colonial rule and, and, and during the, the Vietnam War, um, the, the highest level um, criminals and, and dissidents and political prisoners were kept here um, in, in these kind of horrific conditions. So I, I recently visited these, uh, these, this island, uh, you know, for a holiday, and it's uh, again, it's beautiful and really untainted in many ways. You can see the, the mountains and the, 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 the foliage and the, the, yeah, the, 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 um, the, the flora in the background. And so this is one of the rooms where uh, uh, prisoners were were kept so what this is where they would go to sleep you can see that there there are shackles and stuff at the bottom where um, it would be um, shackling their 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 feet while they slept and you can see the barbed wire on the roof as well this is a close up um, it's famous for also these kind of outdoor prisons that had no roof and so these were called tiger cages and so of course during the day in Vietnam it's, it's super hot it's relatively near the equator and so you would be left kind of baking under the sun and you know your skin would be sunburned and all this stuff and then soldiers would come in and, 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 and torture you essentially. You can see in, in the background a little bit also kind of broken glass at the top. And so uh, a recent body of work that I started making um, is, is related to, to this aesthetic. Um, utilizing barbed wire, and so in, in 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 my pieces that I've made, I'm kind of making these portraits of a people that kind of again relates to the uh, the notion of the of, of the of the bachelor pad of the man cave. These uh, these these sports themes. Um, this is the first image, and I don't know if you can see very clearly, but uh, it's a uh, it's barbed wire that I've I've made by hand. So um, again, kind of this notion of labor where I've kind of hand-twisted barbed wire and created this uh, silhouette of Colin Kaepernick, um, who, if you know, is a, a football player, of course, who is uh, kneeling during the national anthem and who was kind of uh, ushered out of the, of the National Football League um, for these um, actions of protest. And so this particular series, um, you know, relates to this, uh, relates to a lot of things, but uh, um, aesthetically it, um, it mimics kind of the, the logos and emblems that you see in professional sports. So, for instance, like the, the NBA, the National Basketball Association, the uh, Golfing Association. This is another one. I don't know if you can see it. It's of um, Donald Trump playing golf. So it's in a way kind of, um, you know, there's a certain amount of ambiguity to it where, um, you know, whether it's villainizing or heroizing, we're, we're not totally sure. Um, and, 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 and nonetheless, it's, 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 it's meant to, in a way, caricaturize a, a, a lot of these things as well, as we tend to inflate in, uh, in, in media. This is a combination of a, an image, of course, from a, um, it, it looks like a, a, a crucifixion. Um, so half of it is taken from a, um, the Christ figure on top of the mountain in Rio de Janeiro. 
and then the other half is an Abu Ghraib image. So the title of this piece is called um, Touchdown Jesus. And so if you watch uh, American football, um, there's a team in, uh, in Notre Dame, in Notre Dame, uh, Indiana, that uh, in their stadium, there's a huge image of Christ uh, at the back of one end zone. And, you know, his arms are spread out like a, a, a signal for a signal for a, a touchdown. And so that's why it's called Touchdown Jesus. And so this is a, a, a version or an adaptation a, a appropriation of that. So going back to um, architecture, and this is related to the, the work that you see here at Rollins, um, going from one end to the next. Um, the works at Rollins that you see are all um, taken from or related to architectural details that you see in Vietnam, usually in old kind of colonial homes. Again, these kind of traditional spaces that are domestic spaces that are disappearing. And um, in these old homes, you find these beautiful old kind of like graded iron window patterns um, in doorways, windowways. And I was really intrigued by this because of course it's something that's um, disappearing, but then they were just beautiful geometric patterns. And um, as you see in the show, the, the works are painted only on one side. And the, the reason for that is because initially this idea came from um, when I was sitting in my studio. These are some more examples of the patterns. This is this from my studio in, uh, in, in Saigon. Um, I was kind of looking through this and, you know, just being enamored with the light, morning light that was coming through from the sunlight. And one of the things that you don't think about when you're kind of immersed in this kind of, you know, sublimeness, romanticism, whatever you want to call it, is that this image that you're seeing is uh, completely interrupting, is completely interrupted by these patterns. So this idea that, okay, to, to you, your, your mind kind of, uh, uh, kind of connects all the dots and is able to go through this pattern, but in actuality, that uh, that that image, that experience, is interrupted by this pattern. And so, um, this piece is in the show, and it's basically of a sunset. Um, and the, the idea is that the, on one side, the the imprint of the sunset is uh, is emblazoned on 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 that side, so uh, of the window grill, grill. And so, you uh, it, it's basically basically everything that you're not seeing. That you think that you think you're seeing is sort of like how we, you know, when we look uh, on an everyday basis, we 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 always see our nose, but we never see our nose, you know. So it's always there. You always see it, and you just don't think about it. your mind's eye has kind of removed it, has erased it. So this is it's, it's very subtle, this particular body of work, and unlike the traditional ones that are made of metal and iron, uh, the ones that I made are are from wood. And so it's, again, sort of like the poncho. They don't have a, a real utility to them. They're kind of useless. They're, they, they're, they've been um, disarmed, one can say. <coughs> so that, that's the image uh, painted on, on that particular one. This is a moonscape. And so this is just hanging in, in the studio. And usually I started out from, um, I, I started out just painting sort of like light sources from what I could find, whether that be natural or, or artificial. Um, you can see the window, the, the grate on, on this particular piece. This is a, at a friend's house. Um, and you can see kind of the light coming from his house. Um, and so taking this idea that the light, uh, again, emblazons itself on this one side. So this is from that, that house. So it's that same window pattern with the same light that comes from that, uh, that space, or so artificial light. Another kind of, art, uh, another kind of natural sunset, um, a double rainbow, and these are in the exhibition. The process-wise, I mean, these, um, these all start out as full, full sheets of wood that, uh, that are essentially painting panels. So instead of painting on, on canvas, these are, are painted on wood. And what I've done is I've essentially machine cut these patterns out to where 95%, 98% of the original painting is, is lost and destroyed. So you're lost with this, you're, you're left with this fragmentation. And so the work uh, itself is about this fragmentation, about this loss. So uh, in many ways, it relates back to the, the previous paintings of my family that I was making, this, uh, this notion of, uh, of, of incompleteness. So this is a, a, a docu documentary shot of the, of the painting you see here. And on the right is the painting itself before it's cut. So, which is just of a, a romantic sunset in a way. And eventually I started, decided to kind of expand out from just kind of artificial light and natural light. <coughs> this one is more metaphysical, and this one's in the show as well. It's of the Milky Way. 
And so you see the, the original paintings at the top, and you're left again with these very kind of uh, minutia of the original painting as, as ingrained on, on, on the surface of these windows. As I expanded this idea, I started to um, wanted to take a, it away and depart uh, from this kind of romanticism a bit, and uh, I started incorporating uh, more kind of political elements to it. So this piece, which is not in the show, um, the painting on the right, as you can see before it's cut, is of a Thich Quan Duc, who was a, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk who, uh, of course, self-immolated and burned himself to death um, at a busy Saigon Road intersection on uh, 11 June 1963. And so it's this notion of, uh, of history kind of emblazing itself on these structures and these, uh, these architectural details. And so this is, uh, this is where I'm kind of going with this particular body of work. This piece is in the show, and uh, I'm sorry I don't have the the uh, uh, the corresponding uh, painting that goes with it. But um, you see these windows not only in Vietnam, but you also see them in uh, uh, in former Indochina, so Cambodia, Laos, um, um, and, and in these places. And so t in, in modern day Phnom Penh, for instance, in Cambodia, um, uh, which is uh, growing and developing a lot like Saigon. There's a lot of uh, great economic development. It's a really beautiful city, but things are also kind of being knocked down and that kind of stuff. And in Phnom Penh, you you had this beautiful city, but then uh, they've also kept uh, together all these fields where the, the, the Khmer Rouge kind of executed people, what are called the killing fields, and which today, I mean, are just these beautiful undulating landscapes that you see. And so this is a, an image of, a, of the killing, one of the killing fields in, in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. So uh, again, it has this kind of aesthetic of beauty, of, of elegance, of, uh, of uh, yeah, of, 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 of softness, but in reality there is a, a uh, a, a dark undertone to it. So the the last thing I'll talk about is uh, this the, the evolution of this work. So a lot of it is is moving in this kind of uh, in this direction that's related to um, architectural survival or architectural witness things in in in, in Vietnam. So as you can see from this, this is a um, uh, something that most of us recognize, which is a cracked mobile phone um, glass. And where I'm going with this is uh, I've started going back um, in relationship to these windows and the original um, uh, artisan process of, of welding using, you know, again, uh, iron, steel, to weld these beautiful patterns. I started making these in, um, I've started making these traditional windows but utilizing these cracked iPhone windows um, and kind of kind of connecting it again, kind of modernizing it, modernizing it in a way that relates to, that relates more to, I think, what we are going through in this day and age, this idea of always being mediated by, by something else, mediated by technology and, uh, um, and, and in relationship to these windows, kind of taking them back to this, uh, this physical reality. So um, what I'm doing with this is, is, is again, making these windows with patterns, and you can see it here. This is a very simple crack. And it's a, this is made from a steel and iron, and it's, it's, it's not completely finished, but it will give you a, a, a good idea. This is a, a close-up of it, and so you, it's about three-quarter inch uh, wide um, steel um, and about three, I don't know, about uh, three millimeters thick that's been welded together in these kind of uh, um, elaborate um, sinewy patterns. And again, it relates to architecture. This is just a, a Google image that I came across of a, of a, of a house that kind of gives you an idea of, um, of kind of the, yeah, of the architectural destruction that's going on and the, uh, the, the, the loss that's happening. Um, and I, 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 uh, I'm citing this particular image because uh, it's, it's, this is a beautiful image of the doorway and the window kind of being broken out and removed. And so the aesthetic that I'm creating for these uh, these shattered glass windows are are, are related to this. So I'm, I'm I'm incorporating these um, kind of architectural fragments. And so what I do with these now is that I'm I'm creating these windows again. They're each referencing a kind of different cracked iPhone surface, and kind of maintaining um, and and keeping some of the architectural detail that's that's being lost. And so this particular body of work is all all related to that. Uh, on, on the one hand, this kind of mediated reality, and on this other hand, um, this, um, this real reality of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of architectural disintegration. And this is another one. And uh, that's where I left off when I came to Florida, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> and, and that's it. So if you have any um, questions and comments, feel free to 
chime in. Thank you. Austin. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, it's there, but I mean, uh, uh, just about all of my works uses the same kind of um, jumping starting point of creating something that uh, is easily, um, that one can easily access, you know, so things that are recognizable, whether they be window grates or doors or, or, or grass, you know, um, it, it, so a lot of what I, my departure point for a lot of my works are, are things that one would recognize, so you're absolutely right, it goes to complexity, but you you get to complexity by by simplicity. You don't you, you don't go in that in the reverse direction. So a lot of my work is intended to start off and uh, with an, uh, a simple entry point that then one can kind of meander through as 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 far or as deep as one wants to. So it's not always necessary, of course. I mean, it's, it's uh, the explanation helps, and one may or may not get there. Um, but that's that's left up to, to the viewer. You know, for me, uh, when uh, when it leaves my hands, it's 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 gone. You know, it's no longer it's no longer relevant in a way. It's important to me, of course, personally. But uh, uh, that notion of whether people get the full extent of the work is is not so important to me. I think uh, the idea for any works is that it it, it, it you know you um, you can um, it it really is that it it takes you in. It takes you on a little journey. It takes you on a little tour of something. You know, um, whether that be intellectual, uh, aesthetic, or or otherwise. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a bit all, all over the place, but. Sure. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's a it's a mechanical process. So some things I I do by myself, and some things I don't feel the need to do by myself. So these uh, windows that you see there are all mechanical cut using a, a CNC plotter, so in a router. So I create the works. Uh, of course, I paint them first, and then the patterns are are designed in a computer program, and then they're cut. Um, using uh, a CNC router and um, using MDF wood. Um, for this type of uh, project, if you uh, used an, a natural piece of wood, a giant board of wood, um, it would be very problematic because technically you would have, um, uh, you would have um, what, what are they called, um, knots and that kind of stuff. And so it would, it would crack extremely easily. And even as they are now, they're, they're, they're incredibly fragile, even with this kind of press wood. And the ones you see in, in the gallery are of a green color, which is what M, uh, the color of MDF in Vietnam. Yeah, I had to start with the painting. So yeah, it's, it's the, the the paintings are completely, in a way, um, um, decimated and, and and removed. So yes, to Ken. What extent, if any, does the cultural heritage and the art history of Vietnam influence your work? And I confess, I don't know anything about the art of Vietnam. Uh, then, then you know as much as I do. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something I'm, I'm learning as well as I, I live there. I mean, for me personally, I, I've, I've never had that interest until moving there. So uh, for me, um, art in a way has uh, romantically in a way been, been is always a bit more universal. So even in Vietnam, I try not to... Um, um, I, not, I try not to be to overstep my boundaries, you know, because there um, it's a place where, um, again, as I was saying, it's it's very capitalist in sight, but the the the, the backside to it is that it's still like a, a very kind of authoritarian communist government, and so you're still dealing with um, 
uh, issues of censorship there, and so there are artists who have gone through that there. And it's not um, it's not like you know it's not as as heavy handed as China. So if anything happens in Vietnam uh, politically, when you're showing something that shouldn't be shown, it's it's more of a slap on the wrist versus you know being thrown in prison. Nevertheless, as 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 a as a as a foreigner, I I have to be careful because of course I can get deported and that kind of stuff. Um, but um, yeah, but all these things about Vietnam, I'm 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 slowly learning as well, and it's part of the process. And so my natural inclination is to always kind of you know go straight for the the political stuff. But uh, I, I really have to be careful with that because there are a lot of um, young artists in Vietnam who are already dealing with these issues and it's their territory and you don't want to be sort of like a, a carpetbagger or something and go in there and feel like you know you can be the democratic savior or whatever. But nonetheless, um, I, I want to add a, a, a bit of a voice to it, even if it's on, on the margins. So, so culturally, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with a lot of this stuff and so being in Vietnam is completely familiar um, and e at, at ease for me. Um, but all these other things, I'm, I'm slowly learning as well, including you know the history of, of, of contemporary art and, Vietnam, uh, and modern art in Vietnam. It's all kind of slowly, uh, they're, they're all you know pieces to a puzzle that I'm, I'm slowly putting together as well. So it, it took a while to kind of um, assess all this stuff and to kind of be um, and, and to kind of put it in, in kind of a concrete form. You know, I mean, coming from New York, where you know, you walk out your door and you're you're immediately stimulated by something in Vietnam. It, it took a while to be stimulated by things because these are these were things that weren't naturally of interest to me. So it took time to to go in a direction that I felt like I was comfortable with and that had had meaning and I could create things of, of substance too with that direction. So. Anyone else? So if that's it, then uh, thank you so much. We're coming here and missing.